Thank you very much. And we'll start off introductions. My name is Doug Armstrong. I am the vice chair of the Park Rose Neighborhood Association. I'm also on PBOT's Bureau and Budget Advisory Committee, and I am the chair of the Land Use and Transportation Committee in East Portland. JR. Good evening, JR Lilly. He, him, his. I'm your EPAP advocate. Um, and I just put in the chat um, a link to some of the documents we'll be talking about tonight are on this on the website here. So if it's, if you, it's in the email you got earlier, um, but it's also on that. Okay, thank you, JR. Um, and I, I believe I, I hit everybody with the same documents in an email earlier today. So if it's easier for you to go to your emails, um, avail yourself of that. Uh, Sam? Um, hi, I'm Sam Stuckey. Uh, I'm with the Mill Park Neighborhood Association, and uh, I also spend my time here with this group and also with the Old Town, Chinatown Land Use and Transportation Committee. Great. Thank you, Sam. And sure. Sam is, Sam is co-hosting this evening. He's going to um, look for questions and hands raised while I am concentrating on other facets of the meeting this evening. So Carol Hasenberg. I'm Carol Hasenberg. Uh, I'm on the board of the Hazelwood Neighborhood Association. And I am also the co-chair of the East Portland Parks Coalition. And we're currently uh, working on a upcoming solve project and I've been spearheading that. Fantastic. Uh, and Jesse. Yes, I'm Jesse Jacobs. I'm with the Argate Terrace Neighborhood Association. Great. Thank you, Jesse. And Linda C. You're muted, Linda. Is that better? Yep. yep. You're hearing now? Um, Hazelwood board member and uh, unfortunately in charge of the Gleason Street Initiative. Okay. And Scott Cohen. Hey everyone from not East Portland, from North Portland, a garage, undisclosed location. Um, I work for the Portland Bureau of Transportation and I'm happy to be here with you tonight to talk about slow streets and neighborhood greenways. Great, thank you for joining us this evening, Scott. And Linda Bauer. Linda Bauer, Pleasant Valley. Thank you, Linda. David Hampston. Uh, David Hampston with the Transit Alliance of the Piedmonts in Greensboro, North Carolina, and former East Port Portland resident and EPIM person. Great. Thank you, as always, for joining, David. And Connie Shipley. Hi, I'm Connie Shipley with the Wilkes Neighborhood and the East Portland Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Okay, and Bob Ernest. Good evening, my name is Bob Ernest. I'm on the board for the Hazelwood Neighborhood Association. I also serve on the BPS Budget Advisory Committee. And for Scott's uh, information, I happen to live on one of the almost completed parkways, bikeways on 107th place that'll join up uh, Halsey and uh, Oregon Street over to Gleason. Great. Excellent. I expect a full update tonight, Bob. Oh, great. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim Chassie. Hi, Jim Chassie, uh, Powhurst Covert Neighborhood Association and part of the EPIM and uh, former BAC member. Uh, good to see you all. I'm glad that Scott's around and, and hope we have a great meeting tonight. Great. Thank you, Jim. And Arlene. Hi, I'm Arlene Kimura and I'm with the Hazelwood Neighborhood Association at East Portland Neighbors. Okay, and that is everybody. So at this time, um, I'm sorry, Catherine, I didn't get you. That's because I came in late because I had to download the app. Um, I'm Catherine Mushell and I'm 
part of a group called Trees for Life Oregon. And I really appreciate that you have an open meeting because it's how you find out what's going on. Thank you. Exactly. And thank you for joining us, Catherine. Um, at this time, a few little housekeeping updates. Um, if you're wanting to ask a question, Sam is going to be monitoring the chat and you'll be looking for hand raises if you have hand raises. So um, until you're acknowledged, please keep your microphone off so we don't get a lot of cross chatter, um, which really tends to mess up people's um, it, it, it just gums things up. So if you could keep your microphones on silent until you either are acknowledged or uh, you, you feel like you have a point you wanna butt in on, um, but we, we try to keep those at a minimum as we all know. And with that, Scott, I will let you take it away. All right, Thank, thanks a lot. Um, I can share my screen, yes? Yes, excellent. Okay. Don't everybody get too excited. I'm going to do another PowerPoint, courtesy of your, how many bureaucrats have been to your meetings recently? Don't all answer at once. Every month you have a bureaucrat? Not every month? Every month. Every month you get a bureaucratic PowerPoint? OK. Every month you get a PowerPoint? Sorry. At least one. All right. Well, I'll try and make it exciting. I'll do a little like song and dance. Well, I won't sing. You guys don't want me to sing, but maybe I'll dance a little bit. So I'm going to talk um, hopefully pretty briefly about our Slow Streets program. Um, I know Roger Geller came last summer to talk about kind of where we were on our phase two of Slow Streets. This is, we're out of calling them phases. We're now looking at Slow Streets and how to make them more resilient as we uh, move forward. And I just want to talk a little bit about neighborhood greenways, um, since we do have some new ones coming to East Portland, um, some that are under construction, as uh, Bob was letting us know, and some other um, pretty exciting, I think, traffic calming programs that are um, new for PBOT, frankly. So Slow Streets, um, I'll give a quick, just quick primer. Slow Streets is one of th PBOT's three main initiatives that were in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we did a Safer Busy Streets program that expanded pedestrian space um, on, along busy arterials. And we also did our he Healthy Business um, Initiative, which um, you know could be anything from a small kind of parking loading area for quick pickup all the way to street closures for businesses to operate in the right of way. Uh, slow streets um, was about giving people more space to be able to get outside um, in a healthy way. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been over a year since we've had slow streets in and, and as, as we all know, it's been over a year since we kind of went into that lockdown um, last March. And, you know, we just didn't know what was safe and what we could do. And people really wanted to be able to be outside. And if you didn't have a yard, or even if you did have a yard, I mean, you know, uh, being able to get outside and feel like it was a safe thing to do and be able to stay distant from people was, was really important. And so we really wanted to open up the streets for people. We also wanted to um, raise awareness for people that were driving that they should be expecting people to be in the streets on, on slow streets. And then we also wanted to connect people that maybe weren't familiar with neighborhood greenways that, you know, they had these opportunities, they had this network where they could um, get outside in a safe, physically distant way. So what is a neighborhood greenway? So neighborhood greenways are, you know, PBOTs uh, shared um, they're not PBOTs, they're Portland's shared streets where we give priority to people biking, walking, and rolling. Um, they're slow streets. You know, we use traffic calming like speed bumps to keep them slow. Um, they often will have things like traffic diversion to keep traffic volumes low. And then we also make sure that we update the crossings. So people that are biking and walking across the busy streets have an you know, uh, easy, protected way to get across those busy streets. They really kind of overlap um, very closely with our Safe Routes to School network. And we're always trying to connect them to neighborhoods and businesses and, and, and parks and, and schools and things like that. So this map that I'm showing here is our neighborhood greenway network in green lines. 
Um, the sort of dotted green lines are our future neighborhood greenways. And um, the orange dots show where we have our current slow street installations. Um, those were those orange barrels and local access only signs that I showed in an earlier slide. Uh, we have over 200 throughout the city um, at, at uh, you know, all of these uh, locations. Uh, this is what it looks like in the East Portland area. So this is the northern half. Um, it's, you've got 115th up here. Uh, this is, you know, roughly Sacramento and not up here. These, this is the 130s, the new 130s bikeway. This is 150s, just to kind of orient you a little bit since there's not some numbers on that. And I'll come back to this uh, slide in a little bit. I'm in a little bit of a different context. Uh, this is the southern portion, um, you know, Burnside's up here to the north and um, uh, you got Powell Butte down here. This is the Bush neighborhood Greenway. This is 130s, the southern portion of the 100s, the future 100 and, you know, 100s, uh, around 108 that's coming. Oh, and then this is not in the city of Portland. We actually partnered with uh, Play, Grow, Learn, uh, an organization that focuses on help, helping youth get outside in a safe way. And um, when we partnered with them, they were one of our frontline community partners um, early in the pandemic. And we asked them, you know, where do you need space? Where do you need slow streets to be able to serve the communities you're working with? And they actually told us the places they really needed it were in Gresham. And so we partnered with the city of Gresham to put uh, a few installations out there, which, which are still out there um, uh, along kind of like a, um, as close to a neighborhood greenway as Gresham has at, at this point. And that's been a good partnership. So when we launched Slow Streets, we really wanted to focus, um, have a focus with equity in mind. But you know, a key component to equity is really hearing from community. And because we were trying to respond to the pandemic really quickly, it was hard. It was nearly impossible for us to think about how are we going to get community feedback in a really equitable way, and still get the these resources out to the community quickly. So we relied on, on something that PBOTS developed over time called our equity matrix. And basically it takes demographic information on a census track level and helps um, and uses that to create a score from zero to 10, 10 being an area of highest need based on those demographics. And we use that to help us place our slow street locations in areas of higher need based on these, um, this, this matrix. So we have almost 60% of our over 200 locations in census tracts with an equity matrix score of seven to 10. So, you know, that's just a long way of saying we really tried to focus on equity. We tried to find a way to quantify it, but still also meet needs really quickly. And this is the tool that we use. You can see on that map, the darker census um, tracts are the ones that have higher equity matrix scores. And you can see where the locations kind of overlap with that. We also did a lot of collecting of feedback as part of slow streets. So right on the signs for slow streets, we asked people, is this street working? Call 823 safe. Uh, we received over a thousand calls or emails to, to that line. In addition, we also did a text-based survey where we put yard signs out um, on the corridors, the slow street corridors, and asked people to take a text survey. Um, some people that are uh, less fluent in English, less com comfortable with government are more likely to take a text-based survey. And so we wanted to make sure we were hearing from, you know, a wide range of people. I know a lot of people that are more comfortable with government or know how the city works are, you know, they, they've got 823 safe on speed dial. They know about the PBOT traffic and safety team, but we know a lot of people that we don't usually hear from don't have that number on auto dial, don't even know about it and may not be comfortable doing it where they will be com more comfortable taking a text-based survey. So one of the questions we asked was, you know, are you able to maintain safe physical distance on the street? And overwhelmingly people said they were able to. Good, check. That's one of the main goals of the program was that people could have, you know, safe physical distance on the street. But we also asked people, you know, do you feel a stronger sense of community along the slow street? Now that's something that's um, wasn't a goal of the program, but it's something that can be a, a real tangible benefit of slow streets or greenways and something the, the Bureau wants to engender on our streets, um, you know, well beyond COVID-19. And so, you know, hearing from almost two thirds of respondents that, yeah, they felt that stronger sense of community really made us think about if this was a program that could 
um, stretch farther into the future and didn't just need to be a pandemic uh, response. So generally our installations looked good through spring, summer, and even into fall of 2020. Uh, we made a decision to keep the installations up during the winter, even knowing that, you know, there would be less people out walking and biking. It was going to be darker and, you know, things get dirtier in the winter here in Portland. Um, so this is how things looked most of 2020. But as we've kept things up through the winter, we found that there's been, um, you know, more instances of graffiti, which, you know, is not a big deal. We you know, we have a contractor who's working on this program. They come out and either clean it off or change the sign. But, you know, when you see your sign painted on in your street, it's not really bringing you that strong sense of community that we really want the streets to provide for people. Uh, we're seeing, we saw more damage, um, probably um, some of it unintentional like this, where things just kind of got banged and knocked into. Some of it more intentional, where people just decided to toss our stuff to the side and, and get it out of the way. And then we also saw the actual installations become sentient creatures and play hide and seek with our contractor. It's quite amazing that a plastic barrel could become alive and hide itself behind buildings, but somehow they managed to do it. Or, or maybe somebody who didn't like it took our stuff and, and hid it behind their building. So, um, you know, we just had a lot more maintenance through the winter you know, all of these kind of things and more. We've got somebody who's at Crystal Springs and Chavez who literally will come every night and take our stuff and put it in their truck and drive off. Every night that it's reset, they will just take it and I, who knows where it winds up. So um, that was not happening through much of 2020. So whether it's fatigue with the program or fatigue with COVID or I don't know, but we really have seen an increase in the maintenance cost of the program. So we're looking at what we can do to keep those good benefits of slow streets, but reduce this maintenance cost and continue to get that kind of feeling of community on the street. We look to what our um, other cities are doing uh, throughout North America. Slow streets is, you know, been happening all over the world, not just in North America, um, and definitely not just in Portland. So Toronto has um, had these large kind of highway concrete blocks that they had artists paint and then installed their signage on top. Um, Oakland uh, had wood planters built that, you know, doubled as kind of gardens. And then they had artists who actually lived in the neighborhood design the signage that went around the slow street installation. And then San Francisco down on the corner there, they went a little bit more sterile, but still more resilient. Those are materials that can't be, you know, just ripped out of the ground. And with signage that I think is really clear about, you know, the intended user on the street. We've all wanted to go with materials that we've been using in the past. We often use these um, concrete barrels um, that are about four feet wide by two feet high that we fill with soil and that we can put signage in to, um, to use on our neighborhood greenways, either as um, traffic diverters or just as kind of traffic calming features. So this is kind of like a superimposed image to show how we're anticipating using this material and the signage we're planning on using. Our last signage said go slow and um, said local access only. Well, we thought that not everybody knows what local access only means. In fact, maybe I don't even know what local access only means. What is a local trip? Who decides what is local and um, what is the message we're trying to get across? So instead of saying local access only and go slow, we tried to, we tried to use images and numbers to really convey that. So we're adding a 15 mile per hour warning advisory sign um, to really kind of differentiate these streets from 20 mile per hour streets. And we're adding the shared street rider side underneath it that again shows kind of like what San Francisco did, who the expected users will be on the street. Now we are expecting people to still drive on these streets, deliveries, local access to homes, emergency access, of course. But um, you know, if you're turning onto the street, you really should be expecting to be going even slower than you would normally on a local street. And you should be expecting to see people biking and walking. We're also hoping, and because we've had this experience in the past, that people can sort of adopt these, these um, planters. This one that I put our, the new signage on top of is an actual existing planter at the, um, I think it's called the Max and Tucker School, which is at 28th and Holgate. 
they use some of these materials um, in conjunction with PBOT. They actually got a grant. Um, it was like a mini grant for street activation. And then they painted them with their school community and they planted them and um, the street looks great. So we hope that we can kind of do the, have these materials kind of bring that same kind of sense of community with this kind of adoption. So as we've, we're moving forward, we're looking to where we're going to um, put these more resilient um, slow street installations. Um, we don't want to put them on future neighborhood greenways, and that's because we don't want them to get in the way of construction. Oftentimes, on a, where we've put these slow street installations are typically on um, near busier intersections. Well, those are also the intersections we often do the most work on for a future neighborhood greenway. So we don't want to have to, you know, come in a year or, you know, even less later and move something as we're getting ready to do con uh, construction on something else. But we do have some neighborhood greenways in East Portland that are, um, that are already built recently and that we're looking to install the more um, resilient installations. So the, on the 130s at San Rafael and along um, the Hop neighborhood greenway and the 130s a little bit farther south around Gleason. We actually won't do the one on the southern leg of the one at 128th in Gleason because of the school there. They, um, their bus access, um, they were having difficulties with bus, bus access. But um, that's what we're looking at for the northern section. And then on the southern section, we've got, um, we wanna put some bookends on the Bush neighborhood Greenway um, and on the 130 section um, at Division and down by Holgate and um, also on the, the 80s Greenway, um, the just west of 205. Hey, Scott, can I jump in for a second? We have some questions in the chat. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I forgot to say, the one thing I, I always want to say at the beginning, I forgot to say is feel free to interrupt me. And I didn't do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, do, do you want me to read the chat? Does somebody just want to read them out to me? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. read it to you. So. Um, Connie was asking um, if there's a if you think that there was less vandalism during the summer, perhaps because there were more people out and about on the greenways. And then Doug followed up with that and asking uh, if you guys have data or breakdown of where most of the vandalism problems occurred. Um, and then I'll add to that: Are those problem spots where most of the vandalism occurred? Are those also where the more resilient? um planters and concrete diverters going to go or are you staying away from those areas so three-parter uh, yeah yes yes and yes i think yes part of the reason there was less vandalism in the summer part of the reason is there was more people out on the street and longer um i think uh yes we do we are tracking where more of the issues are occurring and yes those are the places we are tackling first but they're not the only places we're tackling first because of those other benefits um but uh, yeah, that is, that, those are all spot on. Interesting. Okay, wonderful. And then David made the comment, perhaps, and it, it seems to have worked if this is the case, perhaps people are stealing these temporary items in order to get PBOT to put more permanent traffic calming devices in, um, remove the gimmicks and replace with actual infrastructure. So I guess, if, if that was the strategy, uh, it, may have, it may have worked. And then uh, Catherine just wanted to point out that at the intersection of 122nd and Foster, close to Leach Botanical and Zanger Farms, that area could use some love, uh, perhaps some, some more permanent infrastructure as well. Sure, I, would, yeah. I would agree with that. I, I, sure. I would agree. I would agree with that too. I mean, the slow streets installations are, is not a would not be something that would happen at 122nd and Foster. So um, we don't have one right now planned for the um, for 128th and Foster. I think that's the where the 130s Greenway lands down there. Foster is at 128th. We could definitely look at that. But 122nd is a you know and Foster are both really busy streets. So they're not a place where we would put up 15 mile per hour signs oh. or or turn calming. Jim has his hand up. Yeah, well, you know what? One of the things I was wondering, Scott, was uh, uh, speaking of the 130s uh, uh, Greenway at 128th and um, Springwater. Uh, 
shouldn't there be some identifying marker there or is there one slated for that area? There's not one slated for where the 130s lands at the spring water. Um, uh, there I would think of it. There's wayfind. There should be wayfinding signs there. Like when we put the 130s in at Springwater, there should be a wayfinding sign that points people um, at that decision point. Everywhere we have a decision point on bikeways, we should have a wayfinding. And if there's not, we can put one in there. Okay. There, there's also a uh, an issue on uh, uh, Bush Street coming from Powell Butte, and I think it's at 136. The wayfinding is not there. It's it's very confusing, and and that's my neighborhood. I ride the uh, Yep, I right ride the uh, um, closer to. Oh, sorry, right in here. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, yeah, it doesn't tell you which which way to uh, turn wherever it turns. Uh, oh, I miss oh, it all the time. Oh, yeah, in in here. Yeah. Okay. Right in there. Well, yeah. Me, yeah. Let me take a note of that. I mean, the the shadows should be. Um, we usually don't use the the wayfinding signs to t help you turn. That's what we usually use the shadows on the ground for. And, and so yeah. and if that's not working, uh, we can definitely add turn sharrows. Wayfinding, we usually do when two bikeways come together and we wanna make sure when you get to that decision point, it's like, oh, do I wanna take the spring water or the 130s? You, you right. can look at that wayfinding and it'll say, you know, this way to this place and this way to this place. And you'll know, oh, I'm going this way. I'm going towards downtown. So I'm gonna keep going on no, the spring I'll water. Take a, I'll take another look at it, but I, it, it's always confusing to me. Okay, and, I'll, take, hey, I'll take a I, look too. Okay, and you know, we help design the uh, facility. So uh, uh, I'll go out and look and, and see what it takes. And th that's the only one that I can think of that, that's of concern to me. But we have no other, uh, we have no other greenways or permanent greenways yet, as they're still building the 150s and, and hundreds and, and so many other uh, uh, facilities out in East Portland. So yeah. Uh, we're looking forward to getting anything and all done we can get out here. Yeah, so I think somebody asked in the chat, why are there so few greenways out there? I, I think um, historically- Well, we all reason, know that. Oh, okay, we all know that. Well, somebody asked. Yeah, um, yeah, well, it's a lack. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I think historically it's because they're something that followed the the neighborhood traffic calming and, and sort of the inner city grid in the, in the Eastern neighborhoods. And when we expanded the program, we, you know, to other places, North, North Portland and Southwest um, and East Portland, we, you know, we really ran into the issues of how do we kind of take this model that worked in inner East, inner Southeast and inner Northeast and translate it out elsewhere. So, I mean, East Portland in motion is part of the, you know, the plan that helped us do that. And then it's just taken us 10 years to get the funding and the planning and the design and the construction. But I mean, the 130s and the hop just came in last year. The 150s, the 100s are coming in this year. 4M is coming in this year, um, which is an all neighborhood greenway, um, but it's, you know, partial neighborhood greenway. Um, and we- So funded, only five years too late. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I, I'm not gonna say that we're um, doing a bang up job or anything, but I I mean, they we are delivering on that East Portland and, in motion vision, but yes, five, at least five years too late. When I go look at East Portland in motion and I see the expected timeline for when those projects are gonna be in, it's, I mean, it's a little bit, um, it makes me feel a little bit Sorry. bad. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, when I, when East Portland in motion was um, getting going, I was only probably a year or two in um, at PBOT. And I was like, this is amazing. Like we're gonna have in five years, we're gonna have this great network out here. Well. I've now been at Peabot for um, you know 13 years, uh, 14 actually coming up, and um, and I realize things take a lot longer than than you know we hope, and so you know it's it is a little disheartening, but I also am glad to at least see that we are continuing to plow through. We're not letting the disheartening or the long timeline make it so we don't deliver on the things we're gonna we say we're gonna do. We're not meeting the timeline. There's I can't. There's no way for me to sugarcoat it or spin it, and I'm not a politician, so I don't have to spin it. But um, no, I know, you know. But but yeah, but we are going to deliver them. So please continue with your presentation. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and please feel free to interrupt me. I'm almost I'm almost done. Um, that's that's where we kind of move away from from slow streets, and I just wanted to give a quick update on some projects that I'm familiar with 
There are more projects obviously out in East Portland that are happening, but these are the ones I've been mostly um, involved with in some way or another. So there are two neighborhood greenways that were funded through the Fixing Our Streets um, gas tax that went to voters again in 2020 and passed. Um, there's the Park Rose 115th Greenway and then the Sacramento Greenway, which will um, we're building a small chunk of it with one of the with the 100th project, and then we'll carry that all the way to the eastern portion of it, um, as EPIM laid out. Uh, the greenways are in, in construction. I talked about was the hundreds and the one 150s, and then portions of 4M. I didn't put that on there because it's um, it's bike lane and and shared street, and and it's it's a little bit of a of a kind of mixed bag as far as what the project is, but that is in construction right now. And then we also, as part of fixing our streets, um, the more recent fixing our streets, we're not supposed to call it fixing our streets too. So I'm trying to get out of the habit of saying fixing our streets too. It's just the fixing our streets program, but the, the update to it, um, we included um, funding for traffic calming on um, essentially cut through streets. So PBOT used to have a traffic calming program back in the 90s and the early 2000s where um, either the bureau or in conjunction with with neighbors and neighborhoods would put in speed bumps and traffic calming um, on, you know, local streets. With that project, that program got cut in around 2007 and it has not come back, but the demand for slowing speeds in neighborhoods, as you all I'm sure know and are aware of, has only dramatically increased. So we got a small bit of funding um, to, I mean, it's not, it's not super small. For me, it actually feels big, but small and relative scale. It's about $500,000 a year to put in speed bumps on um, local cut through streets. And so our first two that we're doing this year are um, this summer, I think it should be in, is on Shaver from 122nd to 141st and Sacramento to 111th to 122nd. This is just a little kind of, this was our early design um, concept and map for the Park Rose neighborhood greenway. Um, it connects down to the Fremont bike lanes and up to Sandy Boulevard. There's, we're gonna look at some other options. Um, you know, this is probably gonna be pretty straightforward, Sharrows and speed bumps and a few improved crossings um, at Shaver and Prescott. And then maybe some intersection kind of realignment at um, 112th and Fremont. It's kind of a really big intersection there. and, and trying to help people kind of make that turn there. And Scott, I'm gonna butt in on, on that one because this is my neighborhood and we have had a question from the neighborhood. Um, how much more consideration have you given to the Skidmore um, route off the 115th? Um, yeah, we, well, I think that's a, I think that's a great route. We, um, I have funding to come up with a design for that for next year. And then um, hopefully to construct it, construct it the year after when we do the 115th so we can connect. I would say the one caveat to that is that our friends in um, Maywood Park allow us to do um, a connection on Skidmore through there because it is such a key part of the route to get to the, um, the um, 205 path. But right. I mean, I, I think it's a no brainer. Um, somebody. Um, I, somebody called and talked to me about it, and I thought, yeah, we 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 should definitely do this. That that would have been Michelle Kimball. That sounds right. Yeah. So I have, um, I in my in my last budget for this coming year, I put in a when I spoke to her, I put in a small. I basically split the project so I could have enough to kind of get it in and start designing it this, this coming fiscal year. You know, we work on the fiscal year. I know you know Douglas, but I mean, uh, we'll start in July with the new fiscal year. And that's when the Skidmore project will go to project development and design. And then the next fiscal year, which would start, you know, July of 2022, we could go to construction. Um, I believe Park Rose is going to construction at that, in that same fiscal year. So fiscal year 22, 23. So it could happen anytime from next summer to summer, you know, spring of 2023, these, these two projects. And we do plan to deliver them in tandem with you know, Maywood, that's me crossing my fingers, you know, um, with Maywood Park uh, on board with us. Great, great, thank you. Continue yeah. on. 
this is the um, our plan for the Sacramento Greenway, which uses you know Sacramento and Russell and Thompson, I believe. Um, it it may it we may find some a new routing. It depends, um, or slightly different routing. The keys to this one is all of the crossings. So we're working on the 148th crossing, which is in conjunction with the 148th road diet that's in design right now and should be constructed sometime, I think this summer or fall. Um, there's already a crossing at 122nd, which is um, good. And we're, con we're connecting this route on um, Russell from, or is it on not from 122nd to the 100th bikeway, which ends at about not and like 111th. So we'll have this long, nice kind of um, east-west route just below I-84. Um, I think this is also that 22-23 fiscal year, but it might be the next year. It might be the 23-24 fiscal year. And I'd be happy to come back and talk more specifically about these. I just kind of wanted to give everybody a taste about what you know what's coming. Uh, this is the um, the whole plan for the East Portland Access to Education and Employment Project, which is building so much of these um, the Greenway um, that we talked about um, that's in construction right now. So this is the 100th Bikeway, our neighborhood Greenway. Um, it's also building you know bike lanes and new sidewalks on Cherry Blossom. It's building a part of the 4M Bikeway and Walkway sidewalk, and then the 150s neighborhood greenway yeah jim did you want to ask something yeah you know we talked to uh, steve sigathy about uh cherry blossom on uh some of the sidewalk infill on the uh west side of cherry blossom coming up the hill uh mm -hmm. from uh up to the 112th street signal he said it was not going to be done 461 linear feet uh would not be uh, completed on uh, cherry blossoms you know anything about that, Scott? I don't. I don't know the specific details. Um, I'd be happy to okay. get more information. Is that what you're, no. you want to know? Okay. No, I think I've got all the information we need. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the specifics of, um, okay. I don't know the very detailed specifics of a lot of these projects. Thanks. But to more enders is the uh, project manager for a lot of these, and he's probably the, um, it's like, uh, he spells it, I can put his name in the chat if you want, or you're more than welcome to just hit me with questions. No, I've got it, yeah. Okay, and then this is the Southern section. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I wasn't cutting off the Southern part of the neighborhood where the 100s um, uh, terminates down here at Bush and where the 150s terminates at the, um, the RFB that, that um, ODOT has here, the rapid flashing beacon, the um, pedestrian crossing here at Powell and 156. We're also um, uh, trying to make a connection, and I'm hoping that that's going to be built um, this year too. That will bring people um, up here along Gladstone and then use Center to make this connection between 136 and um, and 156 to get over here to or 154 to get over to the 150s. The idea being that you know you, if you're coming up on 136 on a bike, you don't want to go all the way up to Bush and then come you know all the way up and over before you find your way over here. That you know you'll want to go and take the the path of least resistance. Yeah, Jim. Uh, yeah, my understanding, Scott, is that they will be uh, putting in an RFB in at uh, that location, but there will be no contraflow bike lane there or at 115th, or excuse me, 108th. So ODOT uh, mm -hmm. doesn't have the uh, funding to, exactly, yeah. to secure the uh, funding for a contraflow bike lane on Powell Boulevard on the south side to connect that small segment from Powell to uh, Bush Street. Um, and I, I had actually talked to Dan Layden about that and uh, also ODOT uh, management. So. Um, do you know anything more about that? Um, no, I know that you are correct. Okay. That, oh, yeah, the, the RFB exists already at um, Powell and 154th, and they are not adding any bike facilities. Um, ODOT is, um, they are, they do not think that RFBs are um, rapid flashing beacons um, just for everybody, you know, in case everybody's not, you know, the rapid flashing beacon is the button you push and the lights blink and you get the ped sign. Um, 
ODOT does not think that they are for bikes. And so they don't, any time that you have one um, on a state highway, ODOT will not make them bike accessible. They don't have any problem with you're on a bike getting up and acting like a pedestrian and pushing the button, um, but they have no desire to make them um, easy to access while you're on a bike because they feel like that's providing a false sense of security because if you're on a bike and you're crossing like a bike, you actually are not afforded the rights of a pedestrian if you're not in the crosswalk. Therefore, they want you to be in the crosswalk if you are going to be on a bike. So they only make them essentially as pedestrian accessible and then you have to kind of navigate that pedestrian access on your bike. Um, we're finding this on almost any state highway. Um, we've got a new neighborhood greenway project um, right up on my, I mean, it's, it's like a block from my house. We actually have a current half signal and we have a push button that's bike accessible for that push button. And ODOT is actually taking that out. So if you're on a bike, you're gonna have to cross against traffic that would be turning in to get to the pedestrian signal. And ODOT saying, well, you know, that's your choice. Or you could get off your bike and do like a two-stage walking motion if you want to do the safest thing. So um, I think they're they're being a little bit like not kind of accepting reality, but you know, I I can also understand their point of, of why they, they feel like they don't want to provide a false sense of security for people that are biking. They don't want to inconvenience the cars. No, well, no special privileges. Um, that, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I, yes, I will let you all decide what I think about all of that. <laughs> yeah, there's just uh, two, two separate guidelines between uh, PBOT and ODOT. That's all it is. Sure. Yeah, that's true. Yep. And it's tough to guidelines. get the two to mix. Yeah, so. guidelines, guidelines equal priorities too. Um, true. Uh, David David has had his hand up for a while and then Carol also has her hand up as well, so. Um, so just quickly, I know that NCDOT is similar to ODOT as far as the uh, RFPs, they strongly encourage putting in a uh, red, green, amber crosswalk, which is usually about the same price. And it's actually legal. I mean, if, if it turns red, everybody has to stop. So I mm -hmm. would encourage you to do that sort of thing, especially on Powell Boulevard. The other question I have is on the Northern section of the previous slide that you have, Scott. So at the end of the 150s where it intersects Gleason, there is actually, um, there was a proposal to put a sidewalk along Gleason, or Halsey, excuse me, along Halsey. And if, if you go over to just beyond where it says 157th, so to the, um, yeah, right there, there's actually a back way that connects you then into San Rafael. Uh, or San Rafael, I guess it's pronounced locally. Um, and um, that way you could eventually get over to Thompson where you're putting in a new bike facility. Is there any movement by um, Peabot to put in a neighborhood greenway on those back streets? Because I used to ride that all the time and it actually is really quite a pleasant connector um, and so it'd be great for people who are living in that um, development, which is a very, uh, what is it, Sunset? Um, or Summer Place, excuse me. Yeah. And um, to connect to the 150s Greenway. So yeah, those back streets through there, you can see the connection through there. And those are open public streets. So um, you're, you're the other thing I will mention when you're uh, presenting the Sacramento Greenway is mm -hmm. that San Rafael is a beautiful, beautiful street, tree line mm -hmm. street. It's one of my favorite bike routes in Portland. Um, so I would encourage you to possibly do a jog. I think, what is that, 144th to Broadway, I think it is, that then connects in with San Rafael instead of okay. taking uh, the jog on 148th. Okay. So anyway, I would encourage you to look into that. And we I, did I actually will. have an original EPIM, I think, of 170s or 160s routes um, that we put into the EPIM that you could take a look at eventually for additional connections. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can I speak now? 
go for it. Okay. Yeah, I would second David's uh, thing there about San Rafael because I live over here and we bike through basically your Sacramento route and variations of it. Uh, we use it. There's two places to cross on 148, right here and right here. We usually do a loop. Wait, I can't um, see where your I can't see your cursor. Um, only my oh, cursor. Right, I, I only got right. the power of the cursor. So okay, um, uh, there's <laughs> um, a way uh, in the southern end. If you follow San Rafael up diagonally to the left, yeah. That's mm -hmm. one place to cross. And the other place Got is it. way, way up towards the freeway. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, yeah, up here by there Sacramento. Are many, many choices there. Uh, anyway, that's a really nice loop. But I was talking, I raised my hand about the southern area. If you could go back to that second slide of to the south near Pell, Pell Butte there. I bike that a lot. But instead of going left off a of 157th and going across to the center street thing you're talking about, I often yeah. have gone off to the right. And then if you go uh, through the little neighborhood there at the foot of um, Powell Butte, you can there's there's kind of an a little impediment that you have to walk your bike through, but you get through to um, the uh, Springwater Trail, and it's quite a nice way to go. You go on the uh, east side of Powell View. Yes, yeah, so I think it's on Negley. Oh, over here. Negley, I think it's. it's okay. Great. Yeah, it's quite a nice, Ooh. you like round the town sort of route. Then you go up the Springwater to the I 205 bike path, or at least before uh, all this stuff happened to clog the bike paths. Uh, yeah, I think it was 165th really and Negley. Yeah, it's like 165th you cross, and then you have to kind of jog a couple streets, and then you cross a little. Uh, it's like you know, it's by the Gun Club. It's um, yeah, right. it's like a little park or, or or like gas line park thing right. or something, and. Uh, and all of a sudden you're out in the country and you're on a road oh, where beautiful. there's horse barns. It's really cool. All right, cool. I will definitely check that out. Thank you. Yeah. And now my last slide. This is my conclusion slide with pretty pictures. Um, so, I mean, we've had some good discussion and I'm happy to keep it going. And uh, yeah, just let me know what, what oh. else you're interested in discussing. Go for it, Jim. I mean, I guess I can just, I mean, Sam, do you want, do you want to be the MC? Do you just want me to call? Okay, go for it, Jim. No, I just, I, you know, I just wanted to throw in the, uh, um, uh, what Carol was saying is uh, uh, a route that they did route around uh, Pal Butte um, years ago. Uh, and David, I think, pointed it out, out to me some 10 years ago. So yeah, that's a great route, but, uh, That'll be in East Portland in Motion 2. All right. I think we added an East Portland in EPM 1. I do remember uh, mapping it out with uh, Roger Geller and with Timo Forsberg. It's somewhere in you know, there. I, I it's part of the, one, the 170s been. route. It could be, yeah. I'd have to go back and look. It's somewhere in there. It's it's probably not far from the uh, the Katie Larcel Memorial Bridge um, at 132nd. Yeah. <laughs> Over I-84, exactly. which uh, of course you'll need to lobby your congressman to get funded. We'll see. All right. Scott, I want to thank you for coming in this evening. Do we have any last minute questions or comments for Scott? Uh, seeing no hands, seeing nothing in the chat. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Just a quick comment. And I'll, Scott, I'll send you an email about this. <clears throat> I hope that when they come down, when they finish the 100s and come down my street, 107th place, 
if somebody gives major consideration to putting a stop sign at 107 and Haslow, cars fly down Haslow and just skate around that corner. And it's only a matter of time. It's not going to be just an incident. It's going to be a death. And we've only lived here for 25 years. And I watch cars get sideways sometimes because they're so angry because they've come into a, a maze there and take it out on the street. And now with the bicycles added to the to the for, to the uh, equation, uh, that's just going to be a bump on their fender and a dead bump. So I, I hope that somebody will pay pay attention to that. I know you put stop signs on the 102 to 122 Pacific Oregon, and I I, I drive that frequently because it's a neat shortcut. Thank you very much for paving it all the way to 122. It's a, it's a major traffic uh, avoider by going that way. But I get to those intersections and I've got the right of way, but I still stop because people still fly down the numbered streets. No one's paying attention. No one. So a quick question for you, um, Bob. Are those streets yeah. fairly narrow? No. Well, I, fairly... I don't, I don't they're, they're not as wide as my street because uh, well, in my neighborhood, they're wider because we have curb sidewalks, the whole, all the amenities. Right. But from 10 or from 110 up is sort of like a uh, it's a center strip. Uh, so, so what I saw, well. I was traveling in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is a university town. And what they did um, to do traffic calming was they alternated parking on each side of the street, and they created a chicane using parked cars. Yeah, was, I thought it was a really very cheap but very effective solution to slowing down. Because it was, you know, university students flying through their neighborhood. Yeah. And so they would actually alternate on the different sides of the street where they allowed parking. They'd put in little parking strips. Right. Um, but they didn't have permit parking or parking meters or anything. It was just, it was free parking. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, David, most of that area has no, only center stripe. It doesn't have curbs and sidewalks. Curbs and sidewalks could facilitate that type of uh, chicane type Right, but if you remove the striping and you put in parking on one side versus the other, oftentimes motorists will then become a little bit more anxious about flying through there. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, I, I'm sure we're going to be putting speed bumps, Bob, on, on 107, but you want to put a stop sign on Haslow as it, it tees into 107? Yes. I will, yeah. ask, the I will ask the engineer. Yeah, because uh, it's only a matter of time until someone's going to get killed there. I mean, it's almost a daily occurrence. I'm out working in the yard, and here will be a car squealing around the corner and gunning it because they're angry, and a bike's going to be nothing but a, a bump in their fender. Yeah, I don't know that a stop sign is going to make a difference, um, but um, maybe for those who are um, more aware. I mean, if you're I mean the the I mean the law already says if you're approaching a T intersection, right, you gotta stop. So maybe somebody who doesn't know the law, the stop sign will help. That but would if you're, be that would be 99% of the drivers that come down our street. <laughs> yes, but I guess my point is is if you're yeah. driving, if you're driving recklessly already, I don't know that the stop sign is gonna be the thing that gets you to calm down and yeah. drive well, less recklessly. But but um it, you know the the law's already on one of seven places traffic side, yeah. but I hear you and I don't think it stop signs a bad idea. I'll check with the, okay. the traffic uh, here. Case in point, we have, is because I live on the dead end piece of 107 and uh, we've had an issue with cars getting, drivers getting angry, they drive down the street, they get angry, they come flying out of the dead end. So I made, my wife and I made some little flags to put on your stop sign. So now I'm telling secrets. Don't take them down, please. But uh, it's actually made a difference because a lot of people will go about 20 feet past the sign and stop and back up. So it's actually it's, working. I see them on Google Streets View. I see the little flags. Cool. That's me. Yeah. I won't, <laughs> I won't share your secret. I, I'm a big fan of the DIY traffic calming. Just don't tell my bosses, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll send you an email about another. Uh, we have two vigilante groups. And one of them sets those cones in the middle of uh, the middle of Pacific Street, and they position the other two cones on the other sides to the point you can only drive one way around one of them. 
And so all the neighbors just, you know, whatever holes, the bigger holes, that's the, that's the way you go. And then somebody over on another street, which I will not name, a vigilante has stolen some from someplace else. And now they've made their street into one of those situations, along with the little boys that hold the flags out. And we know where they stole them from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Scott showed us some some places. Anyway, I don't want to yeah. take, I don't want to take everybody's time. But uh, the other thing, uh, when they when they're putting the uh, the bike pedestrian path through the end of the Union parking lot, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with with that piece of it to go from 106 to 107. Uh, all work mm -hmm. has stopped. The last work was when they hit the sprinkling system and it ran for four days continuously. And finally the city goes, oh, guess what? We made a boo-boo when they came out and at least capped it off. But it ran for four days and that was the last mm -hmm. work and that was about two months ago. And this is where at 106 and 106 in Wasco and oh, the okay. controversial Union parking lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, Teamsters. PM on that. Yeah, the Teamsters, right. So I've taken I enough see, uh, I see Jesse's hand and I see Christopher has a hand raised as well. Let's do, uh, go to Jesse first and then Christopher. Okay, am I, um, am I, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, uh, Scott, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I was unaware of the um, speed bumps that are going in from 122nd to 141st on Shaver. And I know that will make some people in our Argate neighborhood very happy. Um, a concern that I have is that we've got Shaver on one side and Fremont on the other side of, of the park. And um, Fre I live on Fremont and the, nobody, the speed limit was, uh, was lowered to 20 miles an hour. Nobody goes 20 miles an hour. If you go 20 miles an hour, chances are you will be passed. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, some of the stuff like David was saying about potentially using, um, because Fremont is a very wide street, uh, potentially using some, some uh, markings for, for parking or something that could slow, slow down. There's, there's also a need, um, it would be really nice to have a stop sign on 141st, um, which is another, you know, major street that goes down. Um, you know, I, we're, we're looking for anything. Oh, I did notice the other day that when the flashing school sign is on, people actually are slowing down. Um, and I was asking um, the safe streets to schools. I was wondering if there's any way that we could put one of those, this is how fast you're going on that same pole since the street is already 20 miles an hour, which nobody goes. Um, so it's, it's just something, like I say, it's wonderful that the speed bumps are going in on Shaver, but it would also be nice if we could do something on Fremont uh, because I think more traffic may get um, diverted to that street. Yeah, I'll talk to my colleagues. We free, what we've, um, Fremont is a major emergency response route and the Fire Bureau has basically asked us not to put speed bumps on those streets except in exceptional circumstances, basically. So Shaver is a secondary emergency response route and the Fire Bureau has said, you can put special speed bump. They, they don't dictate, they've asked us to use special speed bumps that have channels that are um, spaced uh, at a specific distance so that the Fire Bureau trucks can go right through those spaces. So I will talk to my colleagues and see if they can think of other things. I don't, is there a lot of people parking on Fremont where if you change the direction, it would actually make not a difference? Many. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the problem is when there's not a lot of cars parked on there, it makes the street feel even wider and makes people feel like they can go even faster. But I'm, I'm thinking maybe if there was even, um, you know, designated parking lines, it might make the street mm -hmm. look like it wasn't as wide. Interesting, yeah. Okay, I, I'll definitely bring it back to my colleagues. And you were talking from 122nd to 141st. Is that the main area? Okay. And then a stop sign at 141st. I'll, I'll ask my, my colleagues in engineering about that as well. Thanks. That's all for me. Christopher, did you have a comment? 
I apologize, I, I couldn't join any earlier, so I, I missed most of this. Um, is it okay to give a little bit of feedback about the hop greenway? Sure. Awesome. Of course, we were thrilled to have that happen. I actually live on 114th Avenue. And as you know, that's a one of the big things about it is there are very, very few streets that go in between Gleason and Halsey. Mm -hmm. 114th is a straight shot. We have people going 40 miles an hour. Literally, I had someone pass another car in front of my house the other day. The, it's crazy because now Gleason is being squeezed down. Halsey has the bike lanes. So people try to cut in between the two just to get however they want to go, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is there are two things. One is we all know that Outer East Portland has a dearth of sidewalks, right? I'm wondering if when we create these greenways, could we made it, make it a condition that when we build a greenway, there must be a sidewalk and we should repave the street. There are no sidewalks on 114th Avenue. There, there's a little bit by Gleason and kind of a teeny bit by Halsey, but the bulk of 114th Avenue has no sidewalks. We now have families moving here. We have families with kids in strollers on bicycles. We now have, so in this same greenway, we have pedestrians, wheelchairs. We have, we have like five elder care facilities around here or more. So we have people in walkers. We have two people that ride around in wheelchairs, pedestrians, bicycles, tricycles, strollers, all on the street with no curbs and no sidewalks. And it's, it's how you get to the East Portland Community Office and Hazelwood Hydro Park. So it's kind of like, you know, we have um, safe routes to school, we should have safe routes to community. So what I'm suggesting is, if we could sort of rethink, I don't know, it's just an idea, but when we make these greenways, could we make sure that just on one side, like they did on 117th Avenue, they put, we couldn't fit them on both sides, right? But if we had uh, curbs and a sidewalk, a tight, what do they call it, curb tight? Uh, sidewalk on one side, because what's happening right now, and, the, and I can tell you the speed bump in front of my house, is it was the last one they did, and it's so tiny that I think they ran out of asphalt, <laughs> and so they literally, they just race right over it, and I'm not kidding you, it's like at 40 miles an hour. There are several chop shops around here, and, and they race. It's, it's crazy, so I'd love to see a retrofit of the hop and a new commitment to utilizing this as a way to address the dearth of sidewalks. When you create a greenway, you create sidewalks. Oh, that's it. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, does, I mean, does that I, sound I, reasonable? Well, I mean, it's it sounds reasonable. It's just to we just don't have the money. I mean, sidewalks are just they are by far the most expensive thing beyond a traffic signal that we build. And I, I mean, if we built a, a sidewalk along everywhere, even on just one side of the hop, um, the project would have been 10 to 20 times more expensive. Instead of a $1.4 million project, it would have been a 14 to $28 million project. Um, I, I have to, I, right, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. But That's okay. I was, I was just going to say, so we would like to, you know, I, we definitely have that vision. I mean, all those streets are designated as neighborhood walkways. We would like for them to have sidewalks on both sides, but um, there's just not the funding to do sidewalks on greenways. And so we're focusing our sidewalks. That's what the PED PDX plan, you know, is right. highlighted those major deficiencies in crossing and um, sidewalk gaps. And then, you know, those are the ones we're tackling first. Right. I understand. I guess the, the thing that's curious to me is I was going down Fremont the other day in the inner, inner south, inner east there. And they're repaving Fremont. They're putting brand new corners on every corner, wheelchair accessible, yep. on a street that is 
largely already beautiful in a thriving, affluent area of the city. And from what I understand, that was a $4 million project. How can we justify those kinds of expenses when we know that people, are, my next door neighbor's daughter was killed trying to cross Gleason. You know, that's a scar that will never heal. So I'm just, you know, it's a little hard to reconcile. Chris, can I uh, interrupt? So a lot of the cost is not necessarily the sidewalk. It depends whether the street has a sewer already or not. So some of our, some of the East Portland streets that have no sidewalks, many of them don't have sewers either, uh, storm sewers, but some of them actually do. And Peabot actually has a detailed map of where those streets are. So some of the places where they did add sidewalks, the cost for adding the sidewalk was not as high as they expected because the sewers were already there. It was just a matter of putting in curbs and they could put in the sidewalk. But on a lot of the other streets, they not only have to put in the sidewalk and the curb, but then they have to also have storm sewers in there. And that's where the cost goes through the roof. Um, every time you have to move a curb, that makes it expensive because then you have to move the sewers. But also on a street that has no curb, if you have to put in um, a sewer line that is a storm sewer line, that adds tremendously to the cost. So it's a matter of Peabot investigating 14th, and I know exactly where you're talking about. Peabot has a map somewhere and they can probably tell pretty instantly whether that street has an existing sewer line or not. It probably doesn't, but if it does, then their cost estimate of putting in the sidewalk goes down dramatically. Right, I appreciate it. And, and I don't want to sound ungrateful. We're, we're very happy to have the hop, you know, but it is really difficult to see what's happening out here in this part of town because, you know, if you look at any map of the Peabot equity maps, the air quality maps, the lack of tree canopy maps, the, any of the maps that all show East Portland as being dark, dark, dark. Does that mean I have to stop? <laughs> uh, no, I'm that was me saying, to... go Christopher, go. Oh. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so the only thing I wanted to say is that there's a common denominator here that makes all of these maps line up. And that is, and it goes for the shootings as well, because the people racing, the people parking their cars and their vans and, the, and all of the garbage and the needles and the feces and you name it. It's because this part of town, it's kind of an aesthetic thing. It looks like the wild, wild west. We spent millions of dollars on 102nd Avenue for, for Prosper Portland to buy right of way, create those new sidewalks, plant street trees. They haven't been pruned. The, the sidewalks are buckling, all of the tree wells are broken, there are weeds growing through the, the things. That visual indication says nobody cares. And you can rob, you can steal, you can shoot each other. And, you know, we don't care about your air quality either. So I, I don't mean to bitch and moan, but man, it, this, this year has been hard on the whole city. It's been devastating for East Portland. So just I just needed to get that out. And I appreciate I know you're up against a lot of, you know, requirements and, and limitations. So, you know, thank you for what you're doing though. Um, I would like to add to that before we get off that topic. And um, I noticed you had a- um... Hey, Carol, Carol, be before you go any further, um, we do have a time schedule here. I would like to finish okay. up this presentation area by 8 p.m. no later, which gives us 15 minutes. I know we have a lot of extra comments that people want to make. Um, okay. So it, to uh, respect everyone's time, tr please everyone try to keep it short and sweet. Um, I know Carol, you have a comment. Jim, I saw your hand up. Catherine, I saw your hand go up. Um, and so I, I think that's probably going to Take, take us right up to the eight o'clock hour. So go ahead. Well, just the comment that uh, you had a, a thing at 122nd and uh, holiday, I believe for your little uh, concrete barrel thing. I would suggest that 114th is probably a better place for that. 
I I bike through there all the time, and I I don't see anyone tearing down uh, Holiday Street, but uh, they sure do tear down 114th, and so something is needed. So where where would you suggest putting them? Like at Holiday in Oregon, kind of like on. Bookends? I would say it, yeah, Oregon at least. At Oregon, the there's this old curb that kind of sticks out there anyway, and um people hit it by mistake because it's yeah. uh, really awkward so that might be a great place to put one you know check it out okay oregon one on 114th but oregon to to holiday is that is that what yeah that's around? the corner okay. of your bike route yeah okay. cool i would definitely look for that okay Catherine, you're muted. Sorry, you have to be a nonprofit to get money from the Portland Clean Energy Fund, but 15% of that fund is for green infrastructure. And it just seems like uh, some of the things that people are talking about could use large form trees as uh, street side, traffic slowing <laughs> devices, but PBOT would be ha would have to work with a nonprofit to get those funds. If you go to their website, you have to be a nonprofit to get PCEF funds. It's just a thought. I mean, there's a lot of money there if you could access it. How much money, Catherine? Well, the, you know, when you go to city council, it's like, it's. I want to say 70 million. I mean, it's a lot of money. So if you're a nonprofit, you know, apply for a grant to plant trees along a greenway and see what happens, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Tim, did you want to get one more comment in? I'm good. Any, any, anyone else? Thanks, Scott. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, y'all. I, I appreciate hearing from everybody, and I and I know that we've got work to do out there. But I I hope to keep trying to work with y'all and and finding ways to to move this stuff forward. Okay. Um, okay. Scott, I want to thank you as well, and I will be looping back with you at some point this year to have an update if you have one available. Um, no pressure, <laughs> which means yes, there's pressure. We need updates. Okay, uh, you got it. That, yes, thank you very much for coming in this evening. No problem. Take care, y'all. All right. Okay, with that. Um, we're going to move into the um, EPIM portion of the meeting. Um, as many of you are aware, or some of you may not be aware, uh, we requested an update on EPIM status almost two and a half years ago. And we have received the same paperwork every time we've asked. Um, it has been a daunting process to even pull answers out um, from the people that we have contacts with at PBOT who are intimately involved with EPIM. And uh, just this afternoon, um, they finished up their matrix. They're, they're calling a complete success. Um, yeah, I see, I see you laughing, David. Yeah, um, I, I looked at it and thought, well, this is a sugar-coated email. Um, and I quickly sent it out to everyone, all of our regular attendees, Linda, Catherine, since you're not regular attendees, you didn't get it. But I believe JR has provided a link so you can see the same paperwork that we all saw. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jim. Um, he's going to talk about some of the things and difficulties that we've had to deal with, some of the numbers that he's crunched, and some of the conclusions that he's reached. And from there, I'd like to have a conversation about what our next steps should be. 
Um, before we get into that, however, Steve Sigethy has offered to come in to next month's meeting and spend the entire time talking about EPIM. So I think we should take that opportunity to really um, not necessarily grill Steve on what's happened or hasn't happened as the case may be, but we can use this meeting to strategize what we'd like to talk about next month as well. So with that, Jim, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thanks, Doug. Um, hey, JR, do you have the, uh, I composed a letter um, asking uh, to uh, Commissioner Hardesty and, and uh, Director Warner, uh, asking them to uh, explain uh, why EPIM is 10 years into a five-year plan. There's, you know, we received today uh, 56 projects out of 213 or something like that have been completed. Um, and some of them fully funded. Uh, the hundreds and the 150s bikeways have been funded for six to seven years. Um, and, and we actually granted PBOT uh, some time. Uh, they asked for a year back in 2017, I think, to uh, put everything off uh, in the EPM plan, some of the things that were already funded for a year. And that following year, uh, projects were, were on C three separate occasions, projects were, were delayed for, for another two to four years. So I've just kind of come back into the mix of things uh, because I was uh, working and wasn't able to attend some meetings, but, but I've been keeping up. And I actually went through the uh, city of Portland uh, uh, transportation budget uh, this last year. And this is where I really miss David. He was instrumental in, in going through budgets and whatnot. So I did it on my own this time. And it, it's not an easy and, and fun thing to do. So I always appreciate the, the work that David has done in the past. But um, uh, it, it appears that, that we have a lot of projects funded for East Portland and most of them sidewalks and uh, bikeways. Uh, but just like before, the reason we asked for a uh, five-year implementation process is this has happened to us before. This is not, you know, new news. Uh, this is just the way PBOT has been operating for the last 20, 25 years in East Portland. So, uh, now that Commissioner Hardesty is in charge of uh, uh, the Bureau of Transportation, uh, we need to get some answers from them. Um, there, there's been some, I think, some some projects that were were not funded. The division project, the outer division multimodal safety project, uh, they they came last year and asked for an extra six million that that they didn't have. Uh, for the Outer Division Multimodal Safety Project. And in 2018, we had written a letter to PBOT asking them for $15 million in, in transportation system development charge funding, which is funding that you can use literally for anything at any time. And um, uh, they gave us a list of the projects that they were going to do, and, and that was great. We were happy with that. And uh, uh, the, the following year, everything got put back again. And, and then they came back two years later, and nothing's been done. So uh, I had composed this letter to uh, Commissioner Hardesty and Director Warner. But now that we have the information uh, that we have, and I don't know how many of you read through the uh, East Portland Emotion uh, 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 implementation matrix, but um, uh, it's kind of pathetic. So, and there was a lot of people that worked really hard on this plan for, for years. Um, so we just need to know, number one, that, that PBOT is going to keep up their end of the uh, bargain. And then we need to have some kind of plan in place. Um, and I think we need to uh, advocate for it really hard. Uh, there, there's a lot of money that's been allocated for East Portland, but we don't, you know, East Portland as a whole doesn't receive an equitable amount of per capita transportation funding that the rest of the city does. 
Um, we went from uh, like 43 cents on the dollar back in 2011 to, I think, an average of about 80 cents on the dollar uh, in transportation funding through those 10, this 10 year period. So uh, we, need, we need a commitment from the city that they're gonna get off their ass and, and do something out here. Uh, you know, we've been working too long and too hard on this, and it's it's not a time to let up. We just have to continue to uh, push the envelope and, and say, hey, you know, you guys got to get this thing done. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, we've always been involved at the uh, city level. David was on the, uh, uh, the uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, for several years, and, and I took his spot for a couple of years before I had to resign because I was, you know, working and I couldn't attend the meetings anymore. But um, we've been involved. We've seen projects funded and completed um, in the inner city uh, for years and while they sit on our projects. So it's just time, I think, that, that we really send a message to uh, uh, city council that, that uh, this is it, you know. I'm glad that Scott Cohen was out here, you know, and they do a lot of fluff and buff when they come out here. But um, when it comes down to uh, dollars spent, um, you know, they last year they had uh, in their capital improvement uh, program, they spent $234 million uh, for the city of Portland. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, the city has spent less than uh, $180 million, I think, in East Portland. Now that's PBOT. That doesn't include ODOT money. Now they keep adding that ODOT money and some of the money from Multnomah County funding, uh, East Portland Active Transportation. Uh, there's a couple of different programs that, that were federally funded programs. Um, they have, I mean, they're just now building. So I, I think it's important that we uh, uh, we really send a message to Commissioner Hardesty and, and say, hey, you know, we need this. And not only th this, this East Portland Emotion Plan was actually done to address the inequities for East Portland from 2000 to 2010. We received 44% of the uh, total infill. Or, or, or the total population increase in East Portland from 2000 to 2010. But we received none of the transportation funding. And that, like most of you know who live out here, is the problem. Um, we have no sidewalks to get around. Our bikeways are, are they're not here yet. So, uh, I mean, they're working on them, but they're not here yet. And they should have been here five years ago. So it's, I think it's just time to uh, really put our foot down and, and, and say, let's get this done. So that's kind of what I was at, where I'm at tonight. And I found in the budget, um, maybe 15 or $20 million that we can request right off, the, right, right off the bat, that we can say, okay, let's use this money to uh, fund the rest of the East Portland Emotion projects that haven't been funded. And I think there's, 20 projects that haven't even been, been funded at all. Um, and, and these are not small projects. Everything that, that get, gets done out here in Portland or East Portland needs sidewalks. It's, it's expensive, um, but it's no excuse for them not to do it, especially because the, the area is growing so quickly and continues to grow. Um, and uh, they, they just don't seem to want to uh, spend any money out here. So that's why I wrote the letter. And JR's got the letter, but we may have to change it now that we have the information that I was looking for. Right. And Take it I'll, away. Inter I'll interject here, Jim, um, before we go any further. The, the numbers that Jim is talking about on the EPIM, if you take away the ODOT portion and all the other bits and bobs, um, it's about $187 million over 10 years, and we can all do the math, that's roughly 18 million a year in our huge geographic area, which is, uh, well, to put it bluntly, it's it's a slap in the face. Um, they've 
promised big things, they haven't delivered the big things. And now when the pressure's on, well, yeah, we're gonna do it. Well, we've heard that now for how many decades? Um, we, we all know the story. We've all heard the same things. Um, I think the first thing, Jim, that I would like to see is a rework of the letter that you did based on the information that we now have. Um, and we can kind of table that. You can work on that for the next month and really kind of congeal it down into some good bullet points on what we need to see, not what we would like to see, but we need to see things at this point because they have, in my estimation, with the 238 projects that they had on the list, they've completed 59. That's a pretty piss poor track record in my estimation and putting it bluntly. Um, and Jim, if you have anything else to add, go, go for it. Yeah, I think one of the most important things, especially at this time is because we're under a new administration and if and if you know that, that this transportation package gets done then then east portland is because they have funded a lot of the uh, uh projects they just haven't built them. but if we don't have an east portland in motion too um and i saw lots of comments this evening about different streets that need to be addressed Somebody said about 114th Avenue between uh, uh, Gleason and Halsey. Uh, that's supposed to be a, a bikeway ultimately. But if we don't have an East Portland in motion two to uh, draw upon, then those funds will go where they have other plans. So I think EPM two is, is number one on the priority list right now. And um, we just need to collectively get together and, and uh, get this plan done. And I think we can then do it uh, more cost, effective, cost effectively because we already have a plan in place. There was a lot of things that, that didn't make the EPIM, the original EPIM list that um, uh, we can draw on through EPIM too. Um, and uh, you know, there, there, there's been a change. I mean, it's 10 years since we've done the plan almost. So there are a lot of things that have changed. We have active transportation and we have different mobility devices, uh, e-bikes and scooters that we haven't addressed yet. Um, and, and for a lot of the jobs that are down in uh, the Columbia River corridor, there, there's issues with getting you know, north to uh, those jobs from East Portland. And a lot of East Portland residents uh, uh, work down in the Columbia River corridor. So I think East Portland in motion too is, is important. And then I also want to bring up some of the projects that, that they came to us last month or the month before and just said, we didn't have the money to do it. Um, unacceptable, as far as I'm concerned, that that is a slap in the face. So, you know, when they say, when they commit to doing something, they need to do it. Um, and we need to point it out and, and continue to point out the failures of uh, the Portland Bureau of Transportation. ODOT has its own specific rules and that they're always gonna collide a little bit, but uh, PBOT has, has, has not kept up their part of the bargain where the Oregon Department of Transportation, they keep rolling along with Powell Boulevard and improving uh, the I-205 bike path and there are other, Sandy Boulevard is another example. Um, and they redid I-205, so it's done. But um, yeah, we, we need to hold PBOT accountable, especially. And I will rework the letter um, to show that. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I was all about tonight. So thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, David, did you have a comment or a question? So... I'm going to, with apologies to JR, I'm going to take the role of lore. Um, so on your letter, you need to praise Pivot. You know how to do that. You need to yeah, yeah. just down their back a little bit. Um, but also, you should probably be addressing your letter to city council rather than the transportation commissioner and the transportation director, and then see seeing them. <laughs> And make sure you CC influential people in the state legislature, such as Tina Kotek, 
Um, the other thing though is you'll notice on the EPM that a lot of the projects that did get completed were completed in the first five years. And that was partly because we worked on a strategy on getting them completed. It wasn't just merely asking for projects. We already had a strategy on how we would ask for projects. And that's the thing that I've noticed is kind of missing in the last five years is that strategy needs to be continuously developed and continuously modified. So the strategy we had during those first five years is that we would not only ask the planners for this and that and the next thing and complain about how awful it is in East Portland, but we also ask the mid-level engineers and what mid-level engineers need is a prioritized list of projects. So that's something I would supply to them on the side with everybody, you know, with different neighborhoods approval. So even as you're doing the UPM2, you need to do both. You need to both work with the city planners who believe that they have all the power, even though they have none. And then also work with the city engineers who in fact have the real power, but don't believe they have it. So the way you work with city engineers is you give them a simple list of your priorities, ranked one, two, three, four, five, make sure there's 10 on each list, but no more than that. For each of your neighborhoods, or in the case of Woodland Park, maybe just a couple of projects. Um, but the other thing is that you need to form a team, a diverse team in both racially and age-wise and income level of people who will actually go down and talk with city councilors, including Joanne Hardesty, but also with the mayor, um, asking for specific requests. And you have to figure out what your requests are beforehand. And then also you need to really have um, a very concise idea of what you're asking for both within your neighborhoods and East Portland wide. So you really need to, you know, it's one thing like, you know, Chris was justly bitching about 114th. He lives on there. Everybody bitches about their street. That's normal. And unfortunately, politicians listen to that all the time and they ignore it because that's, that's how they adapt to their environment as politicians. So you have to think about that and figure out a way that they won't ignore you. And that was the real power in the first five years is that we did have a diverse group who would come to city councilors. And I can't remember the woman's name, but she was from the Russian speaking network. She was so persuasive. They couldn't refuse her anything. I and think you need that people was, like that. That was probably Tatiana. Yes, yes, you yes. got it. She was just unbelievably persuasive. How could you refuse her anything? And so you need people like that. But the other thing is one of the things I've learned here in Greensboro is that if you can connect with the engineers and explain to them in their language what you need, you'll actually make a lot more progress. So it's a matter of connecting with the mid-level engineers that Pivot, and it works with ODOT as well, of what you need, but you need to be very concise on your language and you need to not bitch. It's important that you don't bitch. You have to be nice to them. You have to praise them. And then you ask for what you want. You know the routine, Lord trained us on this. <laughs> so it's, um, it works, it really works. You have to praise them. You have, and they have to be a reasonable, justified praise. You can't make it up on the spur of the moment. You have to do some research. They've done some good in East Portland. It's obviously not enough. So the other thing, as you said, Jim, is you look at the budget. So this was explained to me from somebody at TriMet. You not only look at the current budget, not only you look at next year's budget, but you look at the budget five years from now figure out where money has not yet been allocated citywide and figure out where you're gonna put it in East Portland. Which project are you gonna fit into it? So for instance, the big project that's 
in East Portland, it's probably not been done yet, is elevating Foster Road where it floods. So that was in the EPIM. It's a poorly defined project, but a very expensive one. I think it was something like $57 million. Um, where would you get the funding? Well, you can look at Soils and Conservation Service. They have a lot of money, uh, various federal programs dealing with flood control. So it's a matter of you, community citizen, trying to identify things. And it is a lot of work. It's far more than most citizens can handle. But Jim, you can handle it. With Doug's help, <laughs> the team in East Portland, you can do it because you have a lot of collective expertise. And what, you, what expertise you don't have, you can reach out to our allies at Sweeney, at Southeast Uplift, uh, Northeast Coalitions, um, and they can help. But also you need to build your alliances and one thing, another thing I've learned here in Greensboro is your natural allies on bicycle and pedestrian facilities are realtors. So you need to reach out to realty associations and to individual um, high flying realtors and build up an alliance with them because they have influence at City Hall that you don't have. So Sure. That is my chief advice for EPIM too, is you need to work on your strategy and start identifying who your allies are and what allies you need and start building on that and creating a really good team within both EPAP and the neighborhoods on reaching out to politicians. And you need to have a certain amount of diversity, both linguistic um, immigrants and refugees, and new Portlanders. Anyway, I'll stop there. All right. Thank you for all of that, David. That was all very helpful, very well said. Um, and I think it's all information that we kind of intuitively know. Um, we just need to hear it. Um, and it's great to hear it from somebody who now looks from outside in um, on the problems that we've had in the past. and. gives us a path forward on what we should be concentrating on. Um, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, no, I appreciate everything, David, uh, all, all his input. Um, but uh, yeah, right now we're trying to get the, uh, I mean, kind of my focus right now is, is cause I've just come back to this, David, and you and I have both been in at the uh, city level, but I want to make sure that, that more people are active, uh, in a citywide level, uh, in East Portland. And, and it's great that I see, you know, younger faces um, on the screen. Uh, Sam's here and just waiting to do something great. I can feel that. So, uh, but no, you know, there's a lot of uh, collective uh, expertise and, and um, uh, I did spend a lot of time going through the budget. And I've identified um, like I said, about 15 to $20 million over the next five years that, that we can take from uh, um, uh, the city for uh, different on, on different projects and apply them to East Portland Emotion uh, project plans or plan projects. So uh, so we've done that. But, yeah, we just need to do a little more outreach. And, and you're right. We need to tell them how. Uh, uh, how great they are, even though, you know, they haven't done a great job. And it has been the uh, Transportation Commissioner's fault. Um, it, it's really the management at, at PBOT that, that uh, has let everybody down. And, and it, it just seems to be a, uh, a, a normal thing with them. So, no, I'm just kind of poking the bear. So, uh, but somebody needs to, I think, every once in a while. And and I think David told me one time that um, he has all the information, but they actually listen to me. So, um, <laughs> which I thought was kind of a weird comment, but thank you. Um, but yeah, we need to be a little more vocal as, as far as uh, making sure that they know that, that we need to get, you know, at least equitable funding in East Portland. Um, we, we never have gotten an equitable amount of uh, PBOT funding. 
Um, so I think that's what we really need to uh, strive for, but especially we need to uh, ask for EPIM too. And, and that way we'll have plans written up um, when funding becomes available. Right. Thank I you, want to comment a, a, a little bit, um, David, with all due respect, and, and Jim and Doug, and, and everyone on the screen has been at this way longer than I have. Um, I, I admire all the work and the results. Um, and I, I would never want to go to city council with pitchforks, but we cannot be too thankful for what we all admit was a pretty piss poor performance in the last 10 years. Um, that can get us another piss poor performance 10 years from now. Um, I don't think the way shelter to housing continuum played out would play out um, if if they were if if city of Portland was as I don't know scared or um, uh, respectful of East Portland the way they are of other neighborhoods in the central east side. Um, thank you for the shit sandwich. Uh, can I have another, please? Is a is a in in my mind um, strategy. Um, and and I, I guess on a on a personal note right now, I've told Doug this, but um, my family and I are moving out of East Portland next week. Um, not because we don't love East Portland, but because I can't raise my one-year-old uh, in a neighborhood without sidewalks. Um, I can't walk to the library and be scared that um, my wife pushing a stroller is going to get run over by a car. Um, and so we are going to Central East Side where we have sidewalks, trees, and, and parks that we feel safe in. Um, and it's not that we don't love East Portland because we do. Um, uh, we, I, I wish we were, I was gonna, you know, I'm thankful we have the means to, to have options here. Um, uh, and and it's, it's terrifying that there are so many people out in East Portland that don't have the means to go find sidewalks. Um, but my son will be in high school by the time my street gets sidewalks and I can't wait that long. Um, and there are future generations out here um, that are that, that are gonna grow up without sidewalks. Um, if, if this performance from PBOT can, continues at the pace that it continues. Um, and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not giving up on you, Jim. Um, uh, I told Doug I'm going to stay involved, and I, and I, and I will stay involved because I think East Portland needs it. Um, uh, but I'm also not I'm not willing to wait. Um, uh, unfortunately. Thank you for um, revealing that, Sam. I was wondering if you were going to do that this evening. Um, one of the tools that we have in our um, limited little bag of tricks. Um, because this was a council approved, um, EPIM was council approved, um, we can always request an audit from the city. Um, and I, I, I believe because this was a five year implementation plan that has gone way over time, um, I think we would be right in requesting that audit. Um, but I want to get everyone's general feel and I don't want to really use that tool because that's like the the neutron bomb here because the minute you the minute you put that out there people stop talking to you um, and that's a that's a consideration you know how how will we be shut out even further if we use that as an option and I know David you you've got to you've got a definite opinion on that. I, I can see it. So um, it's, like I have no opinion about that, but the going nuclear on advocacy, and we did it several times on the early EPIM, that's part of the reason we got EPIM, okay. was we invited the press out. We got articles in the Portland Tribune, which is, you know, the slimiest newspaper we could find. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and those kinds of stories really get you a lot of mileage if politicians are ignoring you. You know, East Portland's got potholes. What you do is you get them, you do an interview about a street that has, 
water filled potholes, which I'm sure East Portland still has, and um, or lack of sidewalks, you know, before Sam moves out, you make sure the reporter is there and his wife is showing what it's like pushing the stroller on the street. Um, it's good sensational journalism, but I, I hate to say it, a lot of government moves on sensational journalism. And it's, it's a tool that, yeah, it's a nasty, nasty, nasty tool, but let's face it, it's East Portland, the government's ignoring you anyway. Um, so it's, it's, as Laura would say, when you bitch, you need to bitch strategically. And one of the ways is with an audit, and another way is with the press. Another way is losing your temper at a public meeting downtown. But you have to do it strategically. You just can't do it willy-nilly. Quick, quick story to validate what David is saying about the newspaper and the media. When I was the uh, Gateway Urban Renewal chairperson, uh, many of you know Jackie Putnam, and Jackie was vice chair, and then we became co-chairs, and PDC at the time, before they were prosper Portland, PDC wanted to do a little um, feature on Gateway and all the wonderful things that we did and all the accomplishments, and Jackie and I chose in Prunedale, in standing literally in a mud puddle, on an unpaved street. And during the interview with PDC, I was propositioned by a hooker from the Montevilla Motel. I mean, it could not have been more perfect than that. And that went down in the halls of PDC as, oh my God. But I mean, we staged it by being on the, on the, on the unimproved street and the mud puddle. And that hooker was not even part of our agenda. And she just showed up and propositioned me on camera. How cool is that? So yeah, there's there's some mileage that can be gained from that. Absolutely. Oh, I Bob, I would have propositioned you too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we've we've got a lot of various aspects to think about moving forward, and I think Jim, you retooling your letter and um, kind of fine tuning it, putting some definite bullet points in it on what we have to see. Um, Sure. We'll see what we'll see what Steve Sigethy says next month because he's going to be presenting the information that I forwarded to all of you um, on the EPIM, the original EPIM. One of the last pages are the um, is a list of things that didn't get funded, didn't get done. It's uh, you know maybe yay long. I think there's probably twelve projects there. It's in tan, I think, on that page, and what they intimated is they want to start those out for EPIM too and give those top priority. Um, I personally would like to see them completed in EPIM and start with a brand new list. But if we have to start with a priority list, those projects need to be at the top of the list. But that's the discussion for um, continuation. JR, you've been very quiet uh, for this meeting. I, I want to hear what your thoughts are uh, while we still have a few minutes. Um, go ahead. Sure. Thank, thank you. Um, so I, I do appreciate every, what everyone is saying. You know, I, um, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And I agree with you. Um, from where I'm sitting, uh, you know, in the city of Portland and everything, uh, I would, I, yeah, so I definitely like any kind of advocacy is going to be good. So whatever we do, as long as we're asking, as long as we're clear about what we're asking for, I'm all for. Um, the, the folks who are making the decisions, they need to hear our voice. They need to hear what we're talking about. Um, and they need to hear it again and again. So yeah, uh, please go forward and uh, advocate. <laughs> as simple as an email. Uh, make, showing up to meetings and making comments, writing letters and everything. Um, my suggestion, if, I, if you were to ask me uh, a strategy on how to uh, move forward with this, um, would be to, uh, I think, Jim's instincts on a, a letter to Commissioner Hardesty and to uh, Director Warner uh, first and seeing how they, they respond to that. Um, and then if they, you know, and this could be done prior to 
our meeting next week and just expressing we have as simple as we have concerns about EFAM and we would like to discuss about it. Uh, and they can set up, you know, and, and just see how they respond. If it results in meetings and conversations, we, we take it, we, we see what else we can do. If there's no response, then we, uh, that's when we address more of the city of Portland and all, the rest of the commissioners and everything. Uh, just because I just, I believe, um, Commissioner Hardesty, you know, she just um, got put in charge of PBOT. I think she's very interested in this topic. So I think giving her the opportunity um, to address what's going on with e what happened with EPAM one and bring it to her attention and forefront. I think she would like, she would uh, very much like that opportunity um, before we go in there. I think all those options are still there. Uh, so that's on that end. I think the other part um, I like what David said about gathering different um, coalitions and partners. I think it's going to take some education for some folks uh, and then seeing what um, other community members, it could be as simple as, a, as an information listening session because there's a lot of people in East Portland, they share our concerns. Um, you know, they may be from different communities and different neighborhoods. They may have just moved here. They share our concerns. They're just not sure how to have, let their voice be heard. Um, or what are the right, what's the right language for them to express it? So I think um, creating opportunities. Uh, I think we do a really good job at welcoming people to this meeting. Um, I think we just need to continue on that trend and being welcoming, you know, inviting people here and be like, Let's learn about this. Let's get involved uh, and continuing on. Right. Okay. Thank you for that, Jr. Um, and I'm sure you'll you can make yourself available for Jim if he has any technical questions for the letter. Okay. Um, and it, it's not like Joanne is foreign to the EPIM process. Um, she was aware of it when it was happening. So I think she would definitely love to get keyed in on what hasn't happened in the interim that she has not been involved. Um, and that would most definitely light a fire under her, I'm sure. Um, so a lot to think about. Um, any ideas, please email me, email JR. Um, we can, we can uh, kind of congeal our thoughts into one nasty mess and try to pick through it from there. And uh, this is definitely going to be a continuing conversation. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending. Um, we're right at time right now. Um, Jim, I, I know I'll probably be talking to you before uh, next month goes on. Connie, I wanted to highlight the fact that Steve Sigethy is going to be your next um, meeting and that's going to be at 9.45 in the morning if I'm correct. No. no, it's going to be at eight o'clock in the morning. Yes, we're early birds. Oh God, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, what what day is that? It's going to be uh, June ninth, I believe. June 9th. Wednesday. Wednesday, June ninth. Um, do you know what Steve is going to be talking about at the meeting? Well, he's going to talk about the presentation that he gave here last time. But with the twist that it's going to be related to businesses instead of homeowners so much. Uh, and I asked him to focus on 102nd because we gave him a lot of shit about that. Uh, Gleason, because I know people are still unhappy about Gleason and division. And because we only have an hour, you know, where you guys had two hours. So I, I just felt like he couldn't talk about all of the topics. So I told him those were the three that I would like him to be prefer, prepared for. And he's going to bring, is it Leora, Leon, the, the guy who's the statistician? Lior Schweitzer. Lior. He's going to come and give that same presentation that we had here. But I have, we have the Geek Committee gov Government and Economic Affairs Committee. We meet on the last Friday of the month where we come up with questions for the next speaker. And so I have that meeting come up with them and 
I'm going to share those with Steve so he can be prepared. You know, we want to have fruitful conversations. So I'm going to get more input from my committee. Okay, great. Thank you, Connie. And with that, we're a little past 830. So I want to say thank you again to everyone who attended. Thank you for the new faces. We hope to see your faces again. Um, stay engaged. Uh, tell your neighbors. Um, inform people. And, uh, you know, we, we definitely need that citizen-based advocacy. So with that, I will close the meeting and wish everyone a good evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks.